warriors in their own words, is brought to you by The Honor Project, committed to putting the heroes of our nation on record. This presentation is dedicated to the brave men and women of the United States Armed Forces. Colonel Walker Bud Mahuran was an American combat fighter pilot. Flying P-47s with the 56th Fighter Group in World War II, he became an ace three times over in the skies over France and Germany. After the war, Mahuran remained in the newly independent U.S. Air Force. The outbreak of the Korean War in 1950 found him in the Pentagon working on new fighter aircraft procurement. The skills he exhibited in World War II would once again be tested, this time in a new arena of air warfare, the Jet Age dogfight. We interviewed Bud Mahuran at the Chino, California Plains of Fame Museum between an F-86 and a MiG-15. What was the general state of our Air Force at that time? I think we were down to some uh, 32, 33 wings. So we were a small Air Force comparatively. Uh, flying time was was not limited per se, but you didn't get all the flying time that you'd like to get. Uh, the same old problem existed then as probably will exist now in a sense that the nation wasn't devoting a tremendous number of dollars to building experimental aircraft and probing the future of flight. And as a result, we were again kind of staying with what we had. You were telling us that sometime in, in, in the 1948-49 uh, period, a MiG crashed in Czechoslovakia. Could you tell us that story, please? Well, it, it, I think it was in the 1949 time frame. Uh, a, a MiG crashed in a country where they would allow our technical experts, the, the intelligence people, go in and look at it. And as a result of that, our intelligence teams went over there and examined the MiG. And I think there was a degree of uh, apprehension because instead of being a piece of machinery that was not well built or not very sophisticated, it turned out to be a sophisticated airplane. And it was equal to the kind of technique and technology that we were using in our own aircraft factories. And, and it came as a kind of a shock and was kind of an indication that it was a high performance airplane and it was going to be quite a, a combat capable flying machine. Later on you said that uh, during the Berlin airlift you actually uh, saw one of these in the air. Could you tell us about that? Well, I went over right at the end of the Berlin airlift and got to Berlin and in order to do that we had to stay within a corridor that went essentially from Frankfurt into Berlin and back and uh, ground transportation was inaccessible. So we flew in in a DC-3, and it, it strikes me that it was an embassy DC-3 that was carrying mail and so forth back, back and forth. And on the way back, we had to pass over, I think, three German airfields that were occupied by the Russians. One of those airfields was called Zerbst and another Dessau. And on the way back to Frankfurt, I asked the pilot if he would pass over those airfields so I could take a look down below and see what was there. And, yeah, we hadn't made any more in about two turns and a couple of MiGs came right alongside of us and flew on our wing for perhaps five minutes and then turned around and left. But that was the first time I had ever seen one actually in flying. And they're cute and it was cute then and it was a modern flying machine without question. Did you think then that you would be one of these in combat at that time? Did you, did you, did you, did you think that you would probably fly against one of these? Nobody thought much about combat, uh, aerial combat in those days because it seemed like the relationship between the Russians and the United Nations had calmed down except for the, the ruckus in Berlin and uh, people just didn't talk about a state of war. And of course that came when the, when the North Koreans in, invaded South Korea, that came as a shock to everybody and sort of changed our international thinking and what we were going to have to deploy to keep North Korea from conquering the South. It was, a, it was a big change uh, philosophically. The Lockheed F-80, America's first real frontline jet fighter, entered service too late to see action in World War II. But it became the mainstay of U.S. Air Force fighter squadrons in the late 1940s. It was a straight-wing design, which lacked the advantage of German aeronautical research that fell into the hands of the Allies and the Russians at the end of World War II. 
That German research gave rise to the two primary jet adversaries of the Korean War, the MiG-15 and the F-86 Sabre. Bud, tell me about the first time that, that you flew the Sabre and, and what you thought of it the first time you ever got in one. Well, I, I was in fighter requirements in the Pentagon building, and uh, in the fighter desk, you, you get involved in a lot of airplanes, and of course this was one of them, and the first time I ever saw a model of an F-86, Dutch Kennelberger, who at that time was chairman of the board of the North American Aviation Corporation, came walking into my office in the Pentagon building, and he had a model of this airplane, and he said, you're gonna buy 250 of these, and they're gonna cost $225,000 a piece. Sure, fine, that's fine with me. And what had happened was that the procurement business was different then. And a company could come in and they could get uh, uh, agreement to buy an airplane like that. And of course, that ultimately ended up in a production line. Well, a guy named Frank Perigo, who I knew, uh, he was a full colonel. Uh, he commanded the first fighter group at March Air Force Base, and he got the first F-86s. And uh, I went out to visit Frank one time, and. Since I was a headquarters guy, I asked to fly in an 86, and I got to fly one of his 86s. And I was very impressed with it right off the bat. It was superior. There wasn't any question about it. How did it compare, say, to the F-80 or? Um... Oh, it was a Cadillac. The F-80 was limited because of its design and speed. This was a lot faster. Uh, the, the, it would go a lot higher. It had. Uh, uh, excellent accommodations for the physical accommodations for the pilot. That was just a superior in airplane in every respect. And of course, you can expect that when its design was four or five years later than the F-80 design. When the F-86 was first introduced into Korea, what, was there a ramp up time for the pilots or were they experienced enough in the airplane to really be effective? Now the A model had some limitations, I understand. It, it, the A model uh, didn't have what eventually became irreversible controls on the, on the horizontal stabilizer in back. But uh, in the early days, there were, there were a number of, of uh, superior fighter pilots who were aces who achieved uh, a great deal of international notoriety and, of course, were, were very high in the eyes of our public. Jimmy Jabera, whose name is painted on this airplane, was one of the very first aces. In fact, I think he was the first. And I think a guy named George Davis became a double ace. George eventually was shot down by Meg. Uh, a number of guys were aces uh, just by virtue of their combat experience. And of course, there were a lot of people that were over there who had World War II combat experience and had shot down airplanes as, as pilots during World War II. And one of the, the features in life is that if you've done it once, it's easier to do it the second time. The guys that stayed in the Air Force after the war, obviously, were going to be the first called to go into combat again. So there were a lot of people that had previous combat experience, and a lot of the leaders in the early days of the war in Korea were really experienced fighter pilots. And as a result, they were able to transition uh, into the F-86 and into that type of combat pretty successfully. What uh, what were the advantages of the of the F-86 design over the over the MiG? Well, the the, the F-86, of course, was was a Cadillac compared to the MiG being a Ford, and it had all the creature comforts and had very high performance and very high re reliability, and uh, because it had boosted controls, that is to say, in our cars in the United States, uh, we wouldn't even touch a car that didn't have power steering. And in effect, uh, boosted controls means that those controls are the same as power steering. And so we had a rapid rate of roll. We had a lot of advantages. And when we finally got irreversible controls on the horizontal stabilizer, we were able to outturn the MIG and out-dive out, out the MIG and pull out more rapidly than the MIG could uh, in a dive. And there were lots and lots of advantages. And of course, we had a radar gun sight that was a great advantage. And just in general, the airplane was just a more comfortable, satisfying, solid airplane than the MiG, uh, once we examined it, than the MiG turned out to be. Could the, could the airplane take a lot of punishment? Oh, yeah. Uh, 
at one point I became uh, the commander of the fourth fighter group in uh, just outside of Seoul in, in Korea and Francis Gabreski had the 30 or the 51st group about oh, maybe 18 or 20 miles south of us and uh, occasionally his airplanes would get shot up and mine would get shot up and he'd land have his folks would land at my base because it was closer than it would be if they had to fly their damaged aircraft to his base and overnight we would take off all the good parts of his airplanes and put them on our airplanes and put all the bad parts back on his airplanes and he'd come up and see us and say, geez I don't understand how that guy managed to fly home so yes they could they could stand a lot of damage and they had interchangeable parts so you could get them flying again pretty quick Now, Bud, you were telling me before about uh, how the, the Korean War started out with a different kind of airplane, a different kind. Can you just briefly tell me about that again? Uh, we had, when we first got uh, active in the Korean War, we were using the airplanes that were existent and in the inventory at that time, and, and uh, they were essentially all fairly slow airplanes compared to the MiG-15. And uh, the minute the MiG-15 showed up in combat, uh, our Air Force sort of went into a panic, especially the fighter pilots, because this airplane had performance that way in advance of the airplanes that were already in Korea. And as a result, there was a big, big effort to get F-86s over to Korea, so we'd have something that could at least uh, combat on an equal footing with the MiG-15. If we knew that the MiGs were, even the potential was there, why had we not brought our more advanced fighters over to the Far East. The, the trouble with all that was that that n nobody knew wh whose sides uh, were going to be taken in the Korean War. You didn't know whether the Russians were going to come in or the Chinese. Uh, we knew that the North Koreans had their own airplanes, which essentially were the same performance level as the ones we started out with in Korea. And it wasn't until our Air Force was pushing the North Koreans north that the Russian-built MiG-15 started to get into the act. And, and that, of course, determined a sort of an escalation in the air because now we're starting to get involved in higher performance aircraft. And, and our nation had to match those aircraft with whatever we had that had equivalent performance. Describe the first time you, you, you your first MiG that you shot down in, in Korea. What was that like? Well, th that was not representative at all. Uh, I went over there ostensibly for a 90-day uh, trial period. The war looked like it was ending, and, and I needed to get combat ex jet combat experience because a lot of the younger men that were working for me had that experience and had returned from Korea. So I asked to go over, and ultimately, I suppose a half a dozen of us went over on a temporary basis, and I went to work with Francis Gabreski at then the 51st fighter wing and uh, I flew on Gabby's wing for maybe 10 or 12 missions and the first time I shot down a MiG I didn't really know that I'd shot it down. We uh, were coming back from North Korea and I got a MiG out in front and started to fire at it and the gun sight went out which was typical and and uh, when I came home the crew chief asked if we had shot anything down and I said no but in the meantime I had looked back up above the Yalu River the demarcation line between uh, North Korea and Manchuria, and I saw three aircraft go in as flamers, smoke trails and go down, hit the ground and explode, and, and uh, one of the captains who was flying in our flight came rushing in and congratulated me for shooting down a MiG, and he had seen that episode and had watched the airplane go back over the Yellow River and watched it go down, and uh, that isn't a whole lot of satisfaction. You'd rather see all that happen yourself, of course, but that was the first time, and and I think uh, on those first 12 missions, I believe Gabby and I were shot at from behind 11 out of the 12 times. So it was kind of tough combat early on. You mean shot at from the MiGs? Yeah, the MiGs shot at us from, from behind. We, we were greatly outnumbered all during the Korean War. And in the early stages, when the F-86 first got into combat, we had uh, two fighter wings that had F-86s. Uh, one of the wings had two squadrons and the other had three, which in essence meant that there were approximately 125 F-86s assigned. That didn't mean they were all in commission. And we could look across the Yellow River and we could count about 1,500 MiGs on several airfields in Manchuria. 
So we were greatly outnumbered. And so initially, when we went into combat, we were sort of deluged by, by numbers of MiGs coming after us. And uh, that probably was the major reason that, that the first dozen missions that I flew with Gabby, that I thought, boy, this is different. This is some kind of new war. But then, of course, it all changed. And we found that, uh, that we changed our takeoff and landing patterns. We were able to get to higher altitudes. We were able to get where we could easily perform with these things. And then the combat started to change. And those big numbers weren't quite the threat that they were to start with. And as the war kept progressing, uh, it got so they were not only not a threat, but we were looking all over for them because they were hard to come by. <laughs> The MiG was designed to be an interceptor, which meant that it could climb to altitude and go to a high altitude, and it had very high speed. And uh, it really didn't have an advantage against the F-86, uh, other than to say that it was lightweight, good maneuverability, and so forth. But we were flying a Cadillac. We had everything that we needed. We had air conditioning in the cockpit. We had boosted hydraulically boosted controls, so it was easy to fly the airplane. Uh, we had excellent equipment, excellent personal equipment and whatnot, and we knew that people flying the MiG didn't have those same capabilities. This was an uncomfortable airplane to fly, and it was uncomfortable in a sense that, that it would ice up uh, at high altitude, it was hot, and, uh, and you just didn't have the capability that the F-86 had. And we were willing to sacrifice a few little things in order to get that luxury, if you can call it that, and uh, these people weren't willing to sacrifice their lightweight and their interceptor performance. What about the armament? Now, the, the, the F-86 had a, essentially a World War II gun platform, 650 caliber guns. If this thing had some 23 millimeters and 37 millimeter. The MiG with its uh, cannon was very slow firing. And the cannon had a, not only a slow rate of fire, but also uh, it didn't have a big range. And so the MiG had to get close to, to the enemy in order to, to have damage. The machine guns were different. They were pretty much like the F-86, but the F-86 had six of them. We had a high rate of fire. We had lots of ammunition. And uh, it was a better gun platform than this one. There was a difference in a sense that this airplane had a, a gun platform that would lower to the ground for maintenance, and it had easy maintenance. On the other hand, we had to open up the side of the fuselage to maintain our guns. Another innovative design, and there were a lot of innovative designs in the little MiG-15 uh, that, we, that we didn't agree to because we were more sophisticated than our production. The other thing that I noticed immediately is that the MiG-15 has got a, uh, the, the wing is, is in the middle of the fuselage, the F-86 is uh, on the bottom of the fuselage. The MiG has a high T-tail. For some reason or other, the uh, Russians put their horizontal stabilizer at the top of the rudder. And uh, as a result of that, at high angles of attack, when the airplane was, was really pitching up high, the airflow off of the main wing would blanket out the horizontal stabilizer. And as a result, the pilot would lose control. And if he ever lost control to the point where he got in a flat spin, he was unable to recover from a flat spin. And we had any number of instances where uh, our own combat pilots would see a MiG go into a spin and see the pilot, pilot bail out. And, and we didn't have that problem with the F-86. The, uh, the MiG uh, uh, also uh, had swept wings, and uh, they had a little aerodynamic problem in that the flow coming off of the fuselage would have a tendency to flow out toward the wing tips. And as a result, they had to put uh, what they called fences on the wings to keep that flow directed directly aft of the, of the wing itself. Was this a function at a, at a higher sweep angle than the F-86, the wing? No, I think the sweep angle was essentially the same. Uh, essentially, maybe a few degrees one way or another. Didn't have anything to do with that. I think it had to do with the fuselage design. If you notice the MiG, it's kind of fat fuselage. And I think the F-86 had a little more straight line fuselage and and as a result we didn't have spanwise flow th that we knew of and it didn't prove to be a handicap really except that it took the extra fences on the wing to compensate for that 
when you, when you were over there, did you know you were flying against North Korean, Chinese, or Russian pilots? Could you differentiate between the, the pilots you were flying against? When I first got over there, we were always concerned because our ground controllers would alert us that enemy aircraft were in a certain vicinity. And we'd go dashing over to that vicinity and there wouldn't be any enemy aircraft there. So we thought that our radar, our own radar, was giving us false information. And I went up to the radar site, which was about 16 miles north of Seoul in Korea, to see what was going on. And, and uh, we found out that there were normal controllers that we were in conversation with on the radio. In addition to that, there were other controllers who spoke Russian. And they were tuned in to the air ground and air to air communication up above the Yalu River. And that communication was all in Russian. And we were being flown against by Russian pilots almost exclusively. There was a small group of Orientals that flew. Uh, the controllers up north tried to keep that group away from the major Russian pilots, the major Russian organizations. Uh, although they did tangle a couple of times and, and shot each other down. Uh, essentially, what would happen whenever the uh, Russian controllers on the ground north of the Yellow River would scramble their fighters, uh, our Russian-speaking controllers on our side would listen to that order. Then they and English would go over to our English-speaking controllers and say, bandit flight number one, now airborne. And so we would all go dashing over to that area thinking we would see a bunch of enemy aircraft, but they hadn't gotten there yet. And uh, the same thing was true of various geographic locations around in North Korea. And uh, we felt we were given bogus information, and we weren't at all. We were just getting it before the aircraft got there. Uh, we were not allowed, we as commanders, were not allowed to, to make that public with the rest of the pilots because our, our intelligence community didn't want it known that we were listening to the air ground communication, air to air communication on their side. But I found out later that was phony because when I was taken prisoner in North Korea, uh, at one point the interrogators came with a, a big, uh, almost a book of air to air communication in English and they listened to everything I said. So, so both sides were doing the same trick. The, the Russian pilots, you, definitely you knew they were not wearing uh, G-suits, is that why they, they maneuvered the way they did? I can't say definitely that I knew they were not wearing G-suits. Uh, I never had a chance to talk to them, but I'm certain that they weren't in a sense that uh, they, they just weren't up to that standard of, of uh, equipment, flying equipment. They just didn't have the, the flying equipment that we had. And uh, So they couldn't pull the G that you guys could? unless they were young sprogs who were in good physical shape. But, but really and truly, it, it, you weren't pulling G all the time. If you had to pull a lot of G, a lot of G force, uh, chances were pretty good you weren't going to shoot anything down anyway. It, 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 it's just too much, it's too difficult a shot when you're making those high G force turns. About the only time you really pulled high G forces was if you were trying to avoid somebody shooting at you. Then you wanted to make an abrupt turn and, and abruptly get away from the line of fire. So what was the best way to shoot him again? In your... Get up right behind him and let it go. One of the problems that everybody had in the early days of jet uh, uh, propulsion, uh, these, the wings on all of our modern airplanes now are thick and they're strong and they're durable and, and uh, unless you hit pretty directly the bullet is going to glance off the wing. Also. Uh, th there's a lot of thrust coming out of the tailpipe and a lot of instances that would have a tendency to deflect the bullets that were going toward the enemy aircraft. But if you could get a little bit to one side or the other then they were like anything else. You'd destroy them pretty badly with 50 caliber ammunition. Were most of, did you, did you thought within a, a thousand feet you'd close with it, under a thousand feet? Well, generally the the bore site, in other words where the guns all converged was probably out there about 600 yards. And, and they converged and then they widened out again. The, the object, obviously, was to get as close as you could to the enemy aircraft, because that's when you were going to have the most effectiveness. But bear in mind that battle area was small. And these airplanes are all fast. And, and uh, it, it, it was hard to get close, unless you had pretty good 
uh, position on it. It was quite apparent that uh, uh, Russian, entire Russian units were being sent from their home bases into airfields just north of the Yalu River for what really amounted to actual combat training. And uh, for a week or so, once they came in, uh, they would fly across the river and look around. And then maybe for another week or so, they would start getting close to us. And maybe the third week, then they'd start to get really close. And then for a couple of weeks, they'd get in and mix it up with us. And then all of a sudden, there would be a dearth of enemy activity for a period of time, probably because that unit would go back to its home base and another unit would come back in. But obviously, the, the enemy was using that aerial combat as the best training ground you could find. And it was working well for them, except that from our perspective, during the period that they were just looking us over, they weren't providing good targets. But when they wanted to mix it up, then it was different, and, and they were good targets. And quite obviously, uh, it, it, in my perception, the combat average ended up where it was somewhere around 12 to 1. In other words, we shot down 12 MiG-15s for every one of our aircraft we lost. So obviously, the skill levels were completely different. And obviously, the, the, the aircraft had a certain amount to do with that, too. But it was an indication that uh, there, were, there were novices flying against us for periods of time. By the way, when they had the Oriental pilots up, they the Russian controllers on the ground would refer to them as the Koshun flight. And I think that word in Russian is kite. And when our controllers would hear that in Russian, they'd call us right away and they'd say, jackpot flight now in the air. And then we'd really scurry around trying to find those guys because they, were they weren't uh, any good at all. But only the, com only the flight commanders, the, the flight leader knew that, that that they had intelligence that these were Chinese pilots? No, to, to start with, uh, I'm sure that our intelligence community knew that, but they didn't reveal that to us everyday pilots. Well, when, when you said your controllers would refer to jackpot flight now in the air, well, the, you knew that they were Chinese. Sure, because the, they had to be directed in a different language than the Russians. They had to have controllers that would talk whatever, either North Korean or Chinese, to those pilots and Russian guys that would talk to the Russian guys. And the, the Oriental controllers always had to make the, the Russian controllers aware of what was going on because the pilots themselves couldn't talk to each other, different languages. And when they did, on a couple of occasions, they got tangled up and, and MiG shot down MiGs. And, and so it was obvious that this was a dilemma for them. And it was great for us. I, unfortunately, I never got into any jackpot flights, but it would have been great fun. The Russians and the West had very different philosophies about using fighters in combat. The Western tradition championed aggressiveness and freedom of flight leaders, the shooters, while the wingmen protected their rear ends. The Russians demanded strict adherence to ground-based controllers, frequently using diving slash attacks and retreating as fast as they appeared. I think where we, as allies, had the advantage, we respect the individual's thought process, and individuals can think by themselves. In Russia, especially during World War II and, and subsequent years, the guy on the ground had the authority, and he had an army background because they called their units uh, army derivation. And as a result, when the pilots would get in the air, they had to do what the guy on the ground said. And the guy on the ground couldn't, there wasn't any way that he could visualize what was going on in the air. And as a result, uh, the, the Russian pilot had no opportunity for individual initiative. He had to do what they told him to do. And in cases that we were aware of, uh, the, the pilot would do, start to argue with the controller on the ground and the controller on the ground would order him to land and order him to come visit the controller on the ground. So it was an entirely different philosophy than the philosophy we had. And, and in our case, we broke our flights eventually down to where they were operating in two ship elements. In other words, an element leader could go off on his own and, and lead wherever he wanted to go. That posed a tremendous dilemma to the radar operators in, in uh, Manchuria because here the sky is filled with two ships here, two ships there, two ships there, and they're all going willy-nilly. 
So there wasn't any way that they could focus a big ship, 30 or 40 airplanes, into an attack that would be meaningful. They might go after two little airplanes, but then the two little airplanes would disappear doing something else. So it was a tactic that the Russians never adapted to. They always fought a la World War II, where they got big units together, had big units flying down into North Korea, and big units that turned around and went back home. And uh, I think that has changed, my guess is, in the last maybe 20, 15, 20 years with Russian philosophy. Now when we talk to Russian pilots, they're allowed a little bit more uh, individual discrimination on where they go and what to do. It isn't totally ordered from the ground. But then again, there was a problem with all that. You had to have tight control or those pilots were going to jump into their airplanes and land in Japan or someplace else where they could get off free. When, when you were over there, the, the, there was a lot of MiGs flying, so you, you found them at all altitudes. You didn't have to go high or low, or were they, were they where were the MiGs flying in general? In, in, in general, they used, our Air Forces used the F-86 to keep the MiG force from flying down into North Korea to intercept our ground support aircraft, the ground people who were diving, uh, dive bombing, strafing trains and that sort of thing lower performance aircraft. Uh, we, were, we were supposed to keep the MiG-15s away from them. The net result of that, because the MiG has short range, uh, they were pretty much at high altitude all the time and they were pretty much up there where they were fighting with us. Very seldom did we see them down at low altitude and I don't know of any case where MiGs came down and strafed anything on the ground. So they were pretty much high altitude. They're interceptors and, and we of course uh, were considered to be interceptors too. Although eventually when the F-86F came into, into combat over there, they were able to carry bombs. But I understand that uh, the F-86A also had provisions for to carry... They all did, but, uh, but nobody, we hadn't done that before. And I ran the first five bomb carrying missions with F-86s uh, when I was a group commander of the 4th Fighter Group. And we had to go back to Japan and get all the ancillary equipment that it took bomb racks and whatnot in order to carry the bombs. And then we really didn't have a good feel as to how big a bomb we could carry and how far we could carry it. So we did various combinations. For example, we had one external fuel tank and one 500 pound bomb. Then an external fuel tank and a 1,000 pound bomb. Then two 500 pound bombs. Then 2,000 pound bombs. And we would go to the limit of our range just to see if we were able to bomb and then come back home with an adequate fuel supply. Well, why, why the emphasis on, on ground support for this airplane if, in fact, there were other airplanes in the, in the area that were doing the same thing? I mean, Well, it, it, it's obvious that if you have a specialized airplane, that all it can do is ground support, then you've got to provide a whole bunch of airplanes to protect it. If the airplanes that are doing ground support can protect themselves, you don't need those other airplanes. It's an economic measure whereby you get one airplane to do the whole job and you don't have to have a whole bunch of other airplanes along that have less performance that can't do that kind of a job. And uh, uh, having the F-86 as a dive bomber said that if you got uh, intercepted by MiGs, all you had to do is drop the bombs and fight them off. Whereas in, a, in the case of a slower airplane, they drop the bombs and they're still at a terrible disadvantage because they don't have the performance. Was it was the saber was it used widely in the Korean War in that in, in that uh, respect as a dive bomber? Yeah, as soon as as soon as they sent 86 F's into the theater, now equipped to carry both bombs and external fuel tanks, then it was used as a as a dive bomber and an interceptor. Uh, I th I think the uh, the North American company produced seven or eight hundred of F 86 F's that had that capability. And it would carry, what, two 500s? Two 500s or two 1,000 pounders, and it could carry a lot of weight. It just, it, nobody had thought of it in those terms. And, and once it was accepted as a dive bomber, then it was useful, and, and uh, you could use it both as a ground support airplane and as an interceptor. And it worked out very well. But what, um, having flown combat in World War II, 
uh, and other guys over there. What was the difference between flying combat in World War II and, and in Korea and jets per se? Well, I didn't, you really don't notice a whole lot of difference except that you're just going faster. And uh, fuel is more crucial because you're burning a lot more fuel. And obviously you're at higher altitudes and, and uh, there are a lot of physiological problems that are associated with those altitudes. But as far as the combat itself goes, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of difference. In Europe, uh, it depended upon where you were in World War II. Uh, obviously, when there's an armada of 14, 1,500 four-engine bombers and 2,500 fighters, it's a different scene than when you're up against uh, 1,500 MiGs and 125 of your own fighters. But uh, in essence, there isn't that much difference. The objective is the same. You're out to shoot the enemy down, and, and you're out to to, to find where he is, and you're controlled by ground controllers. So essentially, it was about the same thing. What about the, the, the turning speeds now? I mean, you could turn much tighter in a, in a fighter. Does that affect your attack? Well, no, because it, it's all relative. And the enemy that you're trying to shoot down can turn essentially the same speed and the same kind of combat turn that you can. So whether it's a World War II airplane or, or a modern jet. And so that aspect of it, uh, hasn't changed much except for the speeds and the altitudes. Now, it's often said, you know, been said that the, you know, our, our pilots were superior by their training, and, and, but what, what is it about our tactics, lead, wing, and two ship elements that, that made it effective? In that I think you have to go back to the, to the general philosophy of America. Our kids, no matter who they are, seem to be able to ride bicycles and tricycles at a very early age. They start to understand mechanisms when they're in kindergarten. They start to learn mechanical things. And uh, eventually when they get to be 16 or 18, they get to drive cars and they understand those kind of mechanical aspects. That's not really true in a lot of the world. The youngsters in a lot of the world don't get to see uh, mechanical things and have the ability to, to drive them or understand them until they're, they're getting to be pretty mature. That's a major portion of the world, and that's true of the Russians and the North Koreans and everybody else. So just innately, our kids know and are able to cope with mechanical kind of things. Then you translate that to an airplane. Uh, we all play football, basketball, baseball, and whatnot in high school and grade school and so forth. So we understand teamwork, we understand camaraderie, we understand respect for each other, and that's not necessarily true in the major portion of the world. So we start out as, as pilots and as combat pilots with those understandings. And then in the relationship of a, of a leader and his wingman, uh, the, the understanding is the wingman is going to look out for the leader's back end while the leader's looking out in front to shoot something down, with, of course, the ultimate being that eventually the leader goes home and the wingman gets his chance to be out in front to shoot something down. But the philosophy was always the same. Two, four eyes are better than two, and uh, uh, the wingman's duty is to protect the element leader until he gets his chance. And this was not the case with the, uh, the Soviet, the Russian pilots and the, and the MiG pilots. I mean, they didn't have this essential cohesion, they would split when attacked in many cases? Well, the, the, from, from what I understand in reading the history of the Germans in their fights against the Russian Air Force, it was all sort of a mass gaggle. They were all going along. And uh, uh, I know in later years with the Luftwaffe, for example, their pilots were ultimately so untrained because they lacked fuel that they'd have a big gaggle of airplanes and there'd be a few leaders in the middle just to coerce the rest of the people in formation to continue on and to make attacks. But uh, as, as far as the training goes, prior to becoming a combat pilot, there's a lot of that. You learn how to fly more formation. You learn how to do acrobatics. Uh, in some cases, you learn aerial gunnery. So you're equipped with the mechanisms that it takes to become successful. And then it kind of breaks down to who sees it first and, and who wants to see it. And, and where are you and how many of them are there? That's kind of hard to explain. <laughs> yeah, it's been, uh, one ace told me that uh, he could have put in 100 flights in Korea and never see a MiG if he'd wanted to do that. Well, what, what happens in a, 
in any kind of a fighter outfit, in my perception, is that you can look in a room full of pilots ready to go on a mission. In fact, whoever's sitting in that room. And let's say there are 60 or 80 people sitting there. And out of that 60 or 80, about 10% are going to shoot their guns on any given mission. At the bottom end of that spectrum, another 10% are going to have mechanical trouble. They got a cold. Uh, their eyes are bleeding. or so They got some excuse for turning around and going home before they actually get up in the combat area. The rest of the people are going to be going along for the ride. They either won't see anything or they can't get close enough or there's some reason why they don't get involved in combat. Now that's not to say that it's a derogatory comment on any of them because they all have legitimate reasons for doing what they do. But there are some guys that just seem to be aggressive enough that they're always out in front, they're always able to see the enemy and they're always able to get in there and fire their guns. Was there something that uh... That, that we could teach our guys in terms of tactics, uh, other than a wing lead and the four-ship element, it, it, it's just an individual thing. There's nothing that you as a flight leader can, or a squadron commander emphasize kill MiGs, or is it just up to the individual pilot? I mean, what can you do? Well, it, it's obvious that uh, if you've got a squadron commander, for example, that says, uh, gee, I'd love to go on this mission with you, but unfortunately I've got a lot of staff work to do, well, you're going to be in a, in a, immediately suspect this guy doesn't really want to fight. Or the group commander who says, uh, I don't want to fight combat because i got a career to think of. Well, there's, there's another indication that that's not going to be a good man to lead you into combat. You have to want to do it. And you have to be motivated by, by the spirit that says, this is our country and I love it and these guys are doing something bad to me and I'm going to stop that from happening if I can. And then that spirit, of course, uh, is magnified by the, the relationship you have with everybody in your organization. The ground crews are always excited when their pilots have done some good, some good uh, combat work. Pilots are always proud when they can come home and say they fired their guns. There's always an adulation aspect that's very important and leads guys to go out and get in front and perform well. And uh, the only difference between this and, and being a 300 plus hitter in baseball is that you can get killed at, do that, this, at this game. And, and that kind of makes the cheese a little more binding. I don't know if you remember the incident, but Boots Blasey told me the first time he fired on a MiG, he was on your wing, and um, they were coming back, you were coming back from a flight, and, and you, you spotted some MiGs, and uh, Blasey wanted to go ahead, and you said, no, don't do it. Don't, don't attack, and, and uh, but anyway, Blasey went in anyway. Do you remember uh, what happened there? It wasn't it. In my perception, it wasn't quite like that. It was very close. Uh, I had Boots fly my wing, oh, my guess is six or eight times when he first got back to Korea. That was merely because we'd been in combat and there was a lot to catch up on. And that's the best way to, to get a pilot uh, oriented as to what's going on. And I, the, the first time that we went up and saw MiGs, he was flying my wing, and they're up in front of us, and they're turned around, and they're heading back to the border to the Yellow River. And we're at altitude, and, and uh, we're chasing them. And the, the difference in speed wasn't great enough. It, was, you, it took a little while to close on a, on a MiG-15, and we're gradually closing, and Boots is saying to me on the radio, Colonel, I'm going to get me a MiG. I said, wait a minute, Boots. He said, no, Colonel, I'm going to get me a MiG. And he keeps thinking that he's going to shoot a MiG down because we are closing, but very slowly. And finally, I said, just hold your fire, and Boots fired. Well, what happens in any of these airplanes? You fire the guns, you slow down about 30 or 40 miles an hour just from the recoil of the guns. Well, that automatically put us all out of range because Boots fired, his airplane slowed down, and there went the MiGs. So to me, it was a, it's a pretty good... Uh, uh, indication is don't fire till you can see the whites of their eyes. So what, what was the debrief like that, that day? Oh, I don't know. You just, I can't remember the debrief because when you come home in most of those things, there's an aura of excitement and everybody wants to tell his story and everybody's interested and I don't, I don't remember anything. I, I was kind of happy that that was the first time Boots saw, saw Migs and we saw Migs and we knew they were there. We just didn't get a chance. I think it was disappointment more than anything else. And I think he was probably as disappointed as all of us. But he learned, and he's a, he's a competitor in every respect, and, 
and he became a very successful jet fighter pilot. With the busy fall season just around the corner, you might be looking for wholesome, convenient meals for jam-packed days. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, can help you fuel up fast with chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle. Too busy with your end-of-summer goals to cook but want to make sure you're eating well? With Factor, skip the extra trip to the grocery store and the chopping, prepping, and cleaning up too while still getting the flavor and nutritional quality you need. Factor's fresh, never-frozen meals are ready in just two minutes, so all you have to do is heat and enjoy, then get back to crushing your goals. Level up with Gourmet Plus options prepared to perfection by chefs and ready to eat in record time. Treat yourself to upscale meals with premium ingredients like broccolini, leeks, truffle butter, and asparagus. With Factor, you can rest assured you're making a sustainable choice. We offset 100% of our delivery emissions, source 100% renewable electricity for our production sites and offices, and feature sustainably sourced seafood in our meals. This August, get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered to your door. Ready in just two minutes, no prep, no mess. Head to factormeals.com slash warriors50 and use code warriors50 to get 50% off. That's code warriors50 at factormeals.com slash warriors50 to get 50% off. The Americans soon understood that in order to get more than a fleeting shot at red stars, they would have to venture where the MiGs lived, above the Yellow River in China. What about the um, crossing the river? Did you cross the river? Sure. Everybody up there, all the fighter pilots, resented the fact that that was a sanctuary north of the Yellow River. And, and uh, Gabreskian, and I was flying with Gabby at the time, we made, uh, with four other guys, the first penetration above the river uh, that, that, to our knowledge, had been done. And we flew up there just to see what would happen. And we were up there when the MiGs were assembling, and it, and it looked to us like this is the only way to get them. And uh, after that, it gradually matriculated to where a lot of guys were doing it. And we went over there to get them because they're going to come over and kill us if they can. And uh, we had a lot of interesting episodes where I'd hear guys laughing on the air, where are you? I can't tell you. Where are you? And I'll help you. I don't need your help. And we'd get back home and we'd find out that some guy was in a dogfight up in Manchuria someplace and he'd been across the river. Well, eventually that came to a stop because eventually the State Department interfered and they were afraid of the Russian and the Chinese reaction and so they stopped doing that. But anytime you restrict the performance of somebody that's that's out there to get killed or kill, uh, you're putting them in, in hazard's way, and it's a shame. Diplomatic conclusions regardless. So, I mean, it was an open secret that everybody was going across the, well, there were some who preferred not to go across the river, but, but the general consensus was if you wanted to get MiGs, that's where you had to go. I can, I can address that. Uh, we got a call one day from our commander, who was then uh, General Frank Evers, to come to fifth headquarters immediately, every group commander. So we all went there and went to his conference room and he came storming into the conference room and started to pound the table. You guys are crossing the river and by God, I won't have this. I'll court martial and all that kind of stuff. And what had happened was that one of our young pilots had taken off from Gabby's base with his identification friend or foe uh, equipment working. And General Everest had been in the combat ops room and he had watched this guy go across the river up to Mukden, about 200 miles north of Manchuria, circle Mukden twice and then fly back down again. And he said, by God, we're not going to have it. It's illegal. You're crossing the river and it's got to stop. And with that, he called attention and we all stood up, shaking in our boots, and he went out the door, slammed the door, pulled the door open again, poked his head back, and he said, uh, if you're going to do it, turn off the IFF set and slam the door and left. See, well, that was sort of a carte blanche. Uh, uh, if you keep it quiet, go ahead and do it. But ultimately, they did stop that, and ultimately we quit doing it. And it turned out that the, the Joint Chiefs had uh, approved what they called hot pursuit. If you were chasing a guy, go get him. But uh, the 
the proof of hot pursuit was one of those nebulous things, and you could be in hot pursuit as long as you were close, no matter where the guy was. So that w that was a funny sequence, but but it was terrible to handicap our guys with that kind of performance, and unfortunately, we did the same handicap in Vietnam. Given, there were, I believe, 39 aces in Korea, jet aces. Um, in your perspective from, from flying in two wars, what, what is it that makes an, an ace an ace? As opposed to a fighter pilot, what differentiates it? Well, you've got to want to do it to start with. And you have to be motivated by a sense of loyalty and patriotism and, and the ability to win and so forth. So there's a motivation factor that's, that's very, very heavy. And of course, down in there someplace at the bottom, there's the perception that if you're a successful fighter pilot and you're shooting on airplanes, it can't hurt your career. So it, and, and it's peer pressure. If you're flying with a 75 other guys and, and you think you're a better pilot than they are, this is proof. And so the peer pressure kind of says, let's go ahead and do that. There's a lot of glamour attached to it. But what about the, I mean, I know, I know Joe McConnell was apparently a very, he took a lot of risks, I understand that. Uh... He became, well, you flew with him, what about Joe McConnell? I don't remember, of course, in, in back home in the United States, you don't see those kind of risks. And I don't remember flying with him, he was in one of my squadrons, but uh, uh, those risks can get you too. George Davis, who I said was one of our earlier aces, he got so caught up in becoming an ace that he got in between uh, two flights of MiGs and was shooting at the first flight and the flight in back of him shot him down and he got killed. So the, there's that pressure too. You can, you can over excel and you can get shot down just as easy as you can shoot down. And uh, uh, there's so many factors that are involved. Uh, a lot of guys will claim they were good because they could see a long distance. I wore glasses so I could see just as long as anybody could as long as I was wearing glasses. But uh, it, you have to want to do it. And uh, I know in, in Europe I recognized right off the bat that Hitler was a bad guy and so was Mussolini. So when I was over there, I felt obligated as an American citizen to do something about that from my little small perception as a, a pilot in the cockpit of an airplane. And I saw a lot of bombers get shot down and they were hurting our guys. And, and you have a tendency to go in and help your pals and help your friends, even though you don't know them. And that was pretty much what it was. Bud Mahoran downed three MiGs in Korea before catching the so-called Golden BB. Not from a MiG, but ground fire. He spent 16 months in captivity and was subjected to so-called enhanced interrogation techniques used to great effect by the Chinese during the Korean War. In the U.S., it was called brainwashing. He returned home in September 1953. He left the Air Force in 1956, entering a second career the aerospace industry. Bud Mahuran is credited with 24 aerial victories. He's the only American fighter pilot to score kills in the European theater, the Pacific theater, and in Korea. He died in California on May 11, 2010. We hope you've enjoyed this presentation of Warriors in Their Own Words. This program was created and produced by The Honor Project, Heroes of Our Nation on Record, narrated by Bill Ratner. This production is copywritten by Heroes of Our Nation on Record, Incorporated. Any unauthorized broadcast, public performance, or copying is a violation of applicable laws. Greetings from Evergreen Podcasts. We're rolling out a listener survey, and we want to hear from you. The information in the survey will help us gather statistics and in turn make our shows more appealing to advertisers. I know most people don't like ads, but this is one of the only ways our shows make money and help keep their lights on. We promise it will only take a few minutes, but the impact on our podcasts will be tremendous. As a token of our appreciation, we'll randomly select one lucky participant each month to win an exclusive merchandise package from Evergreen Podcasts. Head to evergreenpodcast.com slash listener survey to help a show and possibly get some free stuff for doing so. We can't thank you enough for the support. Now back to the show.